against the epicureans and academics by epictetus translation thomas william rolston this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt Berard. against the epicureans and academics by epictetus from the teaching of epictetus one beliefs which are sound and manifestly true are of necessity used even by those who deny them and perhaps a man might adduce this as the greatest possible proof of the manifest truth of anything that those who deny it are compelled to make use of it thus if a man should deny that there is anything universally true it is clear that he is obliged to affirm the contrary the negation that there is nothing universally true slave not even this for what is this but to say that if there is anything universal it is a falsehood two again if one should come and say know that nothing can be known but all things are incapable of proof or another believe me and it shall profit thee that no man ought to believe any man or again another learn from me o man that it is not possible to learn anything and i tell thee this and i will teach thee if thou wilt now wherein do such men differ from those whom shall i say those who call themselves academics assent o men that no man can assent to aught believe us that no man can believe any one three thus epicurus when he would abolish the natural fellowship of men with one another employeth the very thing that is being abolished for what saith he be not deceived o men nor misguided nor mistaken there is no natural fellowship among reasoning beings believe me and those who speak otherwise deceive us with sophisms what is that to thee let us be deceived will it be the worse for thee if all other men are persuaded that we have a natural fellowship with one another and that we should in all ways maintain it nay but much the better and safer man why dost thou take thou for us and watch at night for our sakes why dost thou kindle thy lamp and rise early why dost thou write so many books lest any of us should be deceived about the gods in supposing that they cared for men or lest any one should take the essence of the good to be anything else than pleasure for if these things are so then lie down and sleep and live the life of a worm wherefore thou hast judged thyself fit eat and drink and cohabit and ease thyself and snore what is it to thee how other men think concerning these matters whether soundly or unsoundly what hast thou to do with us with sheep hast thou some concern for that they serve us when they are shorn and when they are milked and at last when they have their throats cut were it not then to be desired if men could be lulled and charmed to slumber by the stoics and give themselves to thee and the like of thee to be shorn and milked these things shouldst thou say to thy brother epicureans but shouldst thou not keep them hidden from other men and seek in every way to persuade them above all things that we are by nature social and that temperance is good in order that everything may be kept for thee or should we preserve this fellowship with some and not with others with whom then should we preserve it with those who also preserve it towards us or those who transgress it and who transgresses it more than ye who set forth such doctrines for what then was it that roused up epicurus from his sleep and compelled him to write the things he wrote what else than nature the mightiest of all powers in humanity 
nature that drags the man reluctant and groaning to her will for saith she since it seems to thee that there is no fellowship among men write this down and deliver it to others and watch and wait for this and be thyself by thine own deed the accuser of thine own opinions shall we then say that orestes was driven by the furies and aroused from sleep and did not crueler furies and avengers rouse this man as he slumbered and suffered him not to rest but compelled him as madness and wine the priests of Cybele, to proclaim his own evils so mighty and invincible a thing is man's nature five for how can a vine be affected and not in the manner of a vine but of an olive or how again can an an olive be affected not in the manner of an olive but of a vine it is impossible it cannot be conceived neither then is it possible for a man wholly to lose the affections of humanity for even eunuchs cannot cut away for themselves the desires of men and thus epicurus has cut away all that belongs to a man as father of a family and as citizen and as friend but the desires of humanity he hath not cut away for he could not no more than these pitiful academics are able to cast away or to blind their own perceptions although this is the thing that they have striven with all their zeal to do six how shameful is this that a man having received from nature measures and canons for the recognition of truth should study not to add to them and perfect them where they are wanting but the very contrary of this if there be anything that may lead us to the knowledge of the truth they strive to abolish and destroy it seven what sayest thou philosopher religion and holiness what dost thou take them for if thou wilt i shall prove that they are good so be it prove it then in order that our citizens may be converted and honoured the divinity and be no longer neglectful of the greatest things now hast thou received the proofs i have and am thankful therefore eight now since thou art exceedingly well pleased with these things hear the contrary there are no gods or if there be they have no care for men nor have we any communion with them and this religion and holiness whereof the multitude babble is the lying of impostors and sophists or of legislators by zeus for the frighting and restraining of evildoers well said philosopher the citizens shall have much profit of thee thou hast already brought back all our youths to the contempt of sacred things what now are these doctrines not pleasing to thee learn then that righteousness is nothing that reverence is folly that a father is nothing a son nothing well said philosopher proceed persuade the young that we may multiply the number of those who believe and speak with thee from these teachings have grown our well-governed states from these did sparta spring and these beliefs by his laws and discipline did lycurgus plant among his people that slavery is no more base than honourable nor to be free men more honourable than base through these opinions died those who fell at thermopylae and through what others did the athenians forsake their city nine then those who speak such things marry and beget children and take part in public affairs and make themselves priests and augurs of what of beings that do not exist and they question the pythian oracle that they may learn falsehoods and they declare the oracles to others o oh, monstrous impudence and imposture end of against the epicureans and academics by epictetus translation thomas william ralston Apocolo Quintosis by Seneca. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2017. Apocolocintosis or Ludus de Morte Claudii, The Pumpkinification of Claudius by Seneca. I wish to place on record the proceedings in heaven October 13 last of the new year which begins this auspicious age. It shall be done without malice or favour. This is the truth. Ask if you like how I know it. To begin with, I am not bound to please you with my answer. Who will compel me? I know the same day made me free, which was the last day for him who made the proverb true, one must be born either a pharaoh or a fool. If I choose to answer, I will say whatever trips off my tongue. Who has ever made the historian produce witness to swear for him? But if an authority must be produced, ask of the man who saw Drusilla translated to heaven. The same man will aver he saw Claudius on the road, dot and carry one. Will he, nil he, all that happens in heaven he needs must see. He is the custodian of the Appian Way. By that route, you know, both Tiberius and Augustus went up to the gods. Question him. He will tell you the tale when you are alone. Before company, he is dumb. You see, he swore in the Senate that he beheld Drusilla mounting heavenwards, and all he got for his good news was that everybody gave him the lie. Since when, he solemnly swears he will never bear witness again to what he has seen, not even if he had seen a man murdered in open market. What he told me I report plain and clear, as I hope for his health and happiness. Now had the sun with shorter course drawn in his risen light, and by equivalent degrees grew the dark hours of night. Victorious Cynthia now held sway over a wider space. Grim winter drove rich autumn out, and now usurped his place. And now the fight had gone forth that Bacchus must grow old, the few last clusters of the wine were gathered ere the cold. I shall make myself better understood if I say the month was October, the day was the thirteenth. What hour it was I cannot certainly tell, philosophers will agree more often than clocks, but it was between midday and one afternoon. Clumsy creature, you say, the poets are not content to describe sunrise and sunset, and now they even disturb the midday siesta. Will you thus neglect so good an hour? Now the sun's chariot had gone by the middle of his way. Half wearily he shook the reins nearer to night than day, and led the light along the slope that down before him lay. Claudius began to breathe his last, and could not make an end of the matter. Then Mercury, who had always been much pleased with his wit, drew aside one of the three fates, and said, "'Cruel Beldam, why do you let the poor wretch be tormented? After all this torture cannot he have a rest? Four and sixty years it is now since he began to pant for breath. What grudge is this you bear against him and the whole empire? Do let the astrologers tell the truth for once.' Since he became emperor, they have never let a year pass, never a month, without laying him out for his burial. Yet it is no wonder if they are wrong, and no one knows his hour. Nobody ever believed he was really quite born. Do what has to be done, kill him, and let a better man rule an empty court. Clotho replied, Upon my word, I did wish to give him another hour or two, until he should make Roman citizens of the half-dozen who are still outsiders. He made up his mind, you know, to see the whole world in the toga, Greeks, Gauls, Spaniards, Britons, and all. But since it is your pleasure to leave a few foreigners for seed, and since you command me, 
so be it she opened her box and out came three spindles one was for augurinus one for baba one for claudius these three she says i will cause to die within one year and at no great distance apart and i will not dismiss him unattended think of all the thousands of men he was wont to see following after him thousands going before thousands all crowding about him and it would never do to leave him alone on a sudden these boon companions will satisfy him for the nuns this said she twists the thread around his ugly spindle once snaps off the last bit of the life of that imperial dunce but lachesis her hair adorned her tresses neatly bound Piraean laurel on her locks her brows with garlands crowned plucks me from out the snowy wool new threads as white as snow which handled with a happy touch change colour as they go not common wool but golden wire the sister's wondering gaze as age by age the pretty thread runs down the golden days world without end they spin away the happy fleeces pull what joy they take to fill their hands with that delightful wool indeed the task performs itself no toil the spinners know down drops the soft and silken thread as round the spindles go fewer than these are tithon's years nor are nestor's life so long phoebus is present glad he is to sing a merry song now helps the work now full of hope upon the harp doth play the sisters listen to the song that charms their toil away they praise their brother's melodies and still the spindles run till more than man's allotted span the busy hands have spun then phoebus says o oh, sister fates i pray take none away but suffer this one life to be longer than mortal day let me in face and lovely grace like me in voice and song he'll bid the laws at length speak out that have been dumb so long will give unto the weary world years prosperous and bright like as the day star from on high scatters the stars of night as when the stars return again clear hesper brings his light or as the ruddy dawn drives out the dark and brings the day as the bright sun looks on the world and speeds along its way his rising car from morning gates so caesar doth arise so nero shows his face to rome before the people's eyes his bright and shining countenance illumines all the air while down upon his graceful neck fall rippling waves of hair thus apollo but Lachesis, quite as ready to cast a favourable eye on a handsome man, spins away by the handful, and bestows years and years upon Nero out of her own pocket. As for Claudius, they tell everybody to speed him on his way, with cries of joy and solemn litany. At once he bubbled up the ghost, and there was an end to that shadow of a life. He was listening to a troop of comedians when he died, so you see I have reason to fear those gentry. The last words he was heard to speak in this world were these. When he had made a great noise with that end of him which talked the easiest, he cried out, Oh dear, oh dear, I think I have made a mess of myself. Whether he did or no, I cannot say, but certain it is he always did make a mess of everything. What happened next on earth, it is a mere waste of time to tell, for you know it all well enough, and there is no fear of your ever forgetting the impression which that public rejoicing made on your memory. No one forgets his own happiness. What happened in heaven you shall hear, for proof please apply to my informant. Word comes to Jupiter that a stranger had arrived, a man well set up, pretty grey, he seemed to be threatening something, for he wagged his head ceaselessly, he dragged the right foot. They asked him what nation he was of. He answered something in a confused, mumbling voice, 
his language they did not understand. He was no Greek and no Roman, nor of any known race. On this Jupiter bids Hercules go and find out what country he comes from. You see, Hercules had travelled over the whole world, and might be expected to know all the nations in it. But Hercules, the first glimpse he got, was really much taken aback, although not all the monsters in the world could frighten him. When he saw this new kind of object, with its extraordinary gait and the voice of no terrestrial beast, but such as you might hear in the leviathans of the deep, hoarse and inarticulate, he thought his thirteenth labour had come upon him. When he looked closer, the thing seemed to be a kind of man. Up he goes, then, and says what your Greek finds readiest to his tongue. Who art thou, and what thy people? Who thy parents? Where thy home? Claudius was delighted to find literary men up there, and began to hope there might be some corner for his own historical works. So he caps him with another Homeric verse, explaining that he was Caesar. Breezes wafted me from Ilion unto the Cyconian land. But the next verse was more true and no less Homeric. Thither come I sacked the city, slew the people, every one. He would have taken in poor simple Hercules, but that Our Lady of Malaria was there, who left her temple and came alone with him, all the other gods he had left at Rome. Quoth she, ah, The fellow's tale is nothing but lies. I have lived with him all these years, and I tell you he was born at Lyons. You behold the fellow Burgess of Marcus. As I say, he was born at the sixteenth milestone from Vienne, a native Gaul. So of course he took Rome, as a good Gaul ought to do. I pledge you my word that in Lyons he was born, where Licinius was king so many years. But you that have trudged over more roads than any muleteer that plies for hire, you must have come across the people of Lyons, and you must know that it is a far cry from Xanthus to the Rhone. At this point Claudius flared up, and expressed his wrath with as big a growl as he could manage. What he said nobody understood. As a matter of fact, he was ordering my lady of fever to be taken away, and making that sign with his trembling hand, which was always steady enough for that, if for nothing else, by which he used to decapitate men. He had ordered her head to be chopped off. For all the notice the others took of him, they might have been his own freedmen. Then Hercules said, you just listen to me and stop playing the fool. You have come to the place where the mice nibble iron. Out with the truth and look sharp or I'll knock your quips and quiddities out of you. Then to make himself all the more awful, he strikes an attitude and proceeds in his most tragic vein. Declare with speed what spot you claim by birth, or with this club fall stricken to the earth. This club hath oft-times slaughtered haughty kings. Why mumble unintelligible things? What land, what tribe produced that shaking head? Declare it. On my journey when I sped far to the kingdom of the triple king, and from the main Hesperian did bring the goodly cattle to the Argive town, there I beheld a mountain looking down upon two rivers, this the sun espies right opposite each day he doth arise. Hence, mighty Rhone, thy rapid torrents flow, and Arar, much in doubt which way to go, ripples along the banks with shallow roll. Say, is this land the nurse that bred thy soul? These lines he delivered with much spirit and a bold front. All the same, he was not quite master of his wits, and had some fear of a blow from the fool. Claudius, seeing a mighty man before him, saw things looked serious, and understood that here he had not quite the same pre-eminence as in Rome, where no one was his equal. The Gallic cock was worth most on his own dunghill. 
So this is what he was thought to say as far as could be made out. I did hope, Hercules, bravest of all the gods, that you would take my part with the rest, and if I should need a voucher, I mean to name you who know me so well. Do but call it to mind how it was I used to sit in judgment before your temple whole days together during July and August. You know what miseries I endured there, in hearing the lawyers plead day and night. If you had fallen amongst these, you may think yourself very strong, but you would have found it worse than the sewers of Augeas. I drained more filth than you did. But since I want... Some pages have fallen out in which Hercules must have been persuaded. The gods are now discussing what Hercules tells them. No wonder you have forced your way into the Senate House. No bars or bolts can hold against you. Only do say what species of god you want a fellow to be made. An Epicurean god he cannot be, for they have no troubles and cause none. A Stoic, then? How can he be globular, as Varro says, without a head or any other projection? There is in him something of the Stoic god, as I can see now. He has neither heart nor head. Upon my word, if he had asked this boon from Saturn, he would not have got it, though he kept up Saturn's feast all the year round, a truly Saturnalian prince. A likely thing he will get it from Jove, whom he condemned for incest as far as in him lay, for he killed his son-in-law Silenus, because Silenus had a sister, a most charming girl, called Venus by all the world, and he preferred to call her Juno. Why, says he, I want to know why, his own sister. Read your books, stupid, you may go half way at Athens, the whole way at Alexandria. Because the mice-lick meal at Rome, you say. Is this creature to mend our crooked ways? What goes on in his own closet he knows not, and now he searches the regions of the sky, wants to be a god. Is it not enough that he has a temple in Britain, that savages worship him and pray to him as a god, so that they may find a fool to have mercy upon them? At last it came into Jove's head that while strangers were in the house it was not lawful to speak or debate. My lords and gentlemen, said he, I gave you leave to ask questions, and you have made a regular farmyard of the place. Be so good as to keep the rules of the house. What will this person think of us, whoever he is? So Claudius was led out, and the first to be asked his opinion was Father Janus. He had been made consul-elect for the afternoon of the next first of July, being as shrewd a man as you could find on a summer's day, for he could see, as they say, before and behind. He made an eloquent harangue, because his life was passed in the forum, but too fast for the notary to take down. This is why I give no full report of it, for I don't want to change the words he used. He said a great deal of the majesty of the gods, and how the honour ought not to be given away to every Tom, Dick, or Harry. Once, said he, it was a great thing to become a god. Now you have made it a farce. Therefore, that you may not think I am speaking against one person instead of the general custom, I propose that from this day forward the Godhead be given to none of those who eat the fruits of the earth, or whom Mother Earth doth nourish. After this bill has been read a third time, whosoever is made, said, or portrayed to be God, I vote he be delivered over to the bogies, and at the next public show be flogged with a birch amongst the new gladiators. The next to be asked was Dicebitter, son of Vika Pota, he also being consul-elect and a money-lender, by his trade he made a living, used to sell rights of citizenship in a small way. Hercules trips me up to him daintily and tweaks him by the ear. So he uttered his opinion in these words. 
inasmuch as the blessed claudius is akin to the blessed augustus and also to the blessed augusta his grandmother whom he ordered to be made a goddess and whereas he far surpasses all mortal men in wisdom and seeing that it is for the public good that there be some one able to join romulus in devouring boiled turnips i propose that from this day forth blessed claudius be a god to enjoy that honour with all its appurtenances in as full a degree as any other before him and that a note to that effect be added to ovid's metamorphoses the meeting was divided and it looked as though claudius was to win the day for hercules saw his iron was in the fire trotted here and trotted there saying don't deny me i make a point of the matter i'll do as much for you again when you like you roll my log and i'll roll yours one hand washes another then arose the blessed augustus when his turn came and spoke with much eloquence i call you to witness my lords and gentlemen said he that since the day i was made a god i have never uttered one word i always mind my own business but now i can keep on the mask no longer nor conceal the sorrow which shame makes all the greater is it for this i have made peace by land and sea for this have i calmed intestine wars for this laid a firm foundation of law for rome adorned it with buildings and all that my lord's words fail me there are none can rise to the height of my indignation i must borrow that saying of the eloquent messala corvinus i am ashamed of my authority this man my lords who looks as though he could not hurt a fly used to chop off heads as easily as a dog sits down but why should i speak of all those men and such men there is no time to lament for public disasters when one has so many private sorrows to think of i leave that therefore and say only this for even if my sister knows no greek i do the knee is nearer than the shin this man you see who for so many years has been masquerading under my name has done me the favour of murdering two julias great granddaughters of mine one by cold steel and one by starvation and one great grandson el silenus see jupiter whether he had a case against him at least it is your own if you will be fair come tell me blessed claudius why of all those you killed both men and women without a hearing why did you not hear their side of the case first before putting them to death where do we find that custom it is not done in heaven look at jupiter all these years he has been king and never did more than once to break balkan's leg whom seizing by the foot he cast from the threshold of the sky and once he fell in a rage with his wife and strung her up did he do any killing you killed messalina whose great uncle i was no less than yours i don't know did you say curse you that is just it not to know was worse than to kill caligula he went on persecuting even when he was dead caligula murdered his father-in-law claudius his son-in-law to boot caligula would not have crassus's son called great claudius gave him his name back and took away his head in one family he destroyed crassus magnus scribonia the tristionias Asario, noble though they were crassus indeed such a fool that he might have been emperor is this he you want now to make a god look at his body born under the wrath of heaven in fine let him say the three words quickly and he may have me for a slave god who will worship this god who will believe in him while you make gods of such as he no one will believe you to be gods to be brief my lords if i have lived honourably among you if i have ever given plain speech to any avenge my wrongs this is my motion 
then he read out his amendment which he had committed to writing inasmuch as the blessed claudius murdered his father-in-law appius silenus his two sons-in-law pompeius magnus and l silenus crassius frugi his daughter's father-in-law as like him as two eggs in a basket scribonia his daughter's mother-in-law his wife messalina and others too numerous to mention i propose that strong measures be taken against him that he be allowed no delay of process that immediate sentence of banishment be passed on him that he be deported from heaven within thirty days and from olympus within thirty hours this motion was passed without further debate not a moment was lost mercury screwed his neck and hailed him to the lower regions to that bourne from which they say no traveller returns as they passed downwards along the sacred way mercury asked what was that great concourse of men could it be claudius's funeral it was certainly a most gorgeous spectacle got up regardless of expense clear it was that a god was being borne to the grave tootling of flutes roaring of horns an immense brass band of all sorts such a din that even claudius could hear it joy and rejoicing on every side the roman people walking about like free men agatho and a few pettifoggers were weeping for grief and for once in a way they meant it the barristers were crawling out of their dark corners pale and thin with hardly a breath in their bodies as though just coming to life again one of them when he saw the pettifoggers putting their heads together and lamenting their sad lot up comes he and says did not i tell you the saturnalia could not last for ever when claudius saw his own funeral train he understood that he was dead for they were chanting his dirge in anapiests with much mopping and mouthing pour forth your laments your sorrow declare let the sounds of grief rise high in the air for he that is dead had a wit most keen was bravest of all that on earth have been race horses are nothing to his swift feet rebellious parthians he did defeat swift after the persians his light shafts go for he well knew how to fit arrow to bow swiftly the striped barbarians fled with one little wound he shot them dead and the brightons beyond in their unknown seas blue-shielded brigantians too all these he chained by the neck as the romans slaves he spake and the ocean with trembling waves accepted the acts of the roman law oh weep for the man this world never saw one quicker a troublesome suit to decide when only one part of the case had been tried he could do it indeed and not hear either side who'll now sit in judgment the whole year round now he that is judge of the shades underground once ruler of five score cities in crete must yield to his better and take a back seat mourn mourn petty foggers ye venal crew and you minor poets woe woes to you and you above all who get rich quick by the rattle of dice and the three-card trick claudius was charmed to hear his own praises sung and would have stayed longer to see the show but the thalthibius of the gods laid a hand on him and led him across the campus martius first wrapping his head up close that no one might know him until betwixt tiber and the subway he went down to the lower regions his freedman narcissus had gone down before him by a short cut ready to welcome his master out he comes to meet him smooth and shining he had just left a bath and says he what make the gods among mortals look alive says mercury go and tell them we are coming away he flew quicker than tongue can tell it is easy going by that road all downhill so although he had a touch of the gout in a thrice they were come to dis's door 
there lay Cerberus, or, as Horace puts it, the hundred-headed monster. Claudius was a trifle perturbed, it was a little white bitch he used to keep for a pet, when he spied this black shag-haired hound, not at all the kind of thing you could wish to meet in the dark. In a loud voice he cried, Claudius is coming! All marched before him, singing, the lost is found oh let us rejoice together here we found c Silius, consul elect juncus the ex praetor sextus trollus m helvius trogus cotta vetius valens fabius roman knights whom narcissus had ordered for execution in the midst of this chanting company was Mnester the Mime, whom Claudius for honour's sake had made shorter by a head. The news was soon blown about that Claudius had come. To Messalina they throng, first his freedmen, Polybius, Myron, Harpocras, Amphaeus, Pharanactus, all sent before him by Claudius that he might not be unattended anywhere next two prefects justus catonius and rufrius pollio then his friends saturnius lucius and pedopompeius and lupus and sailor asinius these of consular rank last came his brother's daughter his sister's daughter sons-in-law fathers and mothers-in-law the whole family in fact in a body they came to meet claudius and when Claudius saw them, he exclaimed, Friends everywhere, on my word! How came you all here? To these Pedo Pompeius answered, What, cruel man? How came we here? Who but you sent us, the murderer of all the friends that you ever had? To court with you, I'll show you where their lordship sits. Pedo brings him before the judgment seat of Aeacus, who was holding court under the Lex Cornelia to try cases of murder and assassination. Pedo requests the judge to take the prisoner's name and produces a summons with this charge. Senators killed? 35. Roman knights? 221. Others as the sands of the seashore for multitude. Claudius finds no counsel. At length out steps P. Petronius, an old chum of his, a finished scholar in the Claudian tongue, and claims a remand. Not granted. Pedo Pompeius prosecutes with loud outcry. The counsel for the defence tries to reply, but Aeacus, who is the soul of justice, will not have it. Aeacus hears the case against Claudius, refuses to hear the other side and passes sentence against him quoting the line as he did so be he done by this is justice undefiled a great silence fell not a soul but was stupefied at this new way of managing matters they had never known anything like it before it was no new thing to claudius yet he thought it unfair there was a long discussion as to the punishment he ought to endure. Some said that Sisyphus had done his job of porterage long enough. Tantalus would be dying of thirst if he were not relieved. The drag must be put at last on wretched Ixion's wheel. But it was determined not to let off any of the old stages, lest Claudius should dare to hope for any such relief. It was agreed that some new punishment must be devised. They must devise some new task, something senseless, to suggest some craving without result. Then Aeacus decreed he should rattle dice forever in a box with no bottom. At once the poor wretch began his fruitless task of hunting for the dice, which forever slipped from his fingers. For when he rattled with the box and thought he now had got him, the little cubes would vanish through the perforated bottom. Then he would pick him up again and once more set a trying. The dice but served him the same trick, away they went a flying. So still he tries and still he fails, still searching long he lingers, and every time the tricky things go slipping through his fingers. 
just so when sisyphus at last once gets there with his boulder he finds the labor all in vain it rolls down off his shoulder all on a sudden who should turn up but caligula and claims the man for a slave brings witnesses who said they had seen him being flogged caned fisticuffed by him he is handed over to caligula and caligula makes him a present to aeacus aeacus delivers him to his freedman menander to be his law clerk end of apocolo Quintosis by seneca The Circular Snare from Spiders by Cecil Warburton, a Cambridge Manual of Science and Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Circular Snare. Select the most perfect circular snare at hand and examine it attentively in the autumn when the large garden spider the pira diademata is mature it will probably be easy to find such a snare a foot or more in diameter it is stretched within an irregular frame of foundation lines of extra thickness and strength and consists of a large number of radii or spokes connected by what appears to be a series of concentric circles in reality a continuous spiral like the hairspring of a watch the central portion is different from the rest of the wheel probably in the very center there is a vacant space and round this a hub consisting of a spiral line different in appearance from that of the main spiral it does not leave a radius exactly at the point where it strikes it and the rather zigzag effect has caused it to be known as the notched zone touch the web and it adheres to the finger but all its lines are not adhesive test this with some fine pointed implement and the foundation lines the radii and the notched zone will give negative effects the spiral line alone is viscid and its viscidity is due to the presence of thousands of little beads of gummy matter strung on a thin elastic thread the vast number and uniformity of these beads estimated at a hundred and twenty thousand on a large web excited the wonder and admiration of naturalists until it was proved that they were not deposited by the spider as beads at all but as a uniform coating of viscid matter which subsequently arranged itself into equidistant globules easily explicable by the physicist indeed precisely the same phenomenon is seen on a dew-laden web where similar but very much larger beads of water decorate all the lines from the hub of the wheel we shall very likely notice a rather stout cable diverging from the plane of the snare and leading to a nest of leaves spun together here the spider is to be found when not on duty in the center of the wheel and here it constructs its egg cocoons this then is the complete circular snare but we shall understand it much better if we watch the spider at work in its construction the first business of the spider is to lay down the foundation lines any sort of trapezium or even a triangle if large enough in a more or less vertical plane will suffice and under some circumstances the operation is simple enough the spider attaches a line at the point of departure and crawls along spinning as it goes and holding up the newly spun thread by the claws of one of its hind feet till it reaches a suitable spot for its furthest limit it then hauls in the slack and makes it fast it will probably return along the line thus laid down still spinning to the starting point 
thus doubling the strength of the cable and indeed a large spider will often repeat this operation several times now the upper boundary of the future web is secured it is next necessary to find points of attachment for the lower boundary and the spider either drops or climbs down always carrying a line from one of the ends of the upper line till it reaches a spot suitable for its purpose and the previous performance is repeated if there is any difficulty about a fourth attachment it is always open to the spider to climb back along the two lines already laid down and by carrying a loose line with it to secure at all events a triangular framework this framework whether trapezoid or triangular will be reinforced several times and made thoroughly trustworthy before the work of making the actual snare is proceeded with now the foregoing operation is obviously perfectly simple in certain cases as for instance when a spider has chosen a lattice work or the mouth of an empty barrel as its pitch but snares may easily be found in situations where such a mode of procedure seems impossible in a pine forest for example one may see huge webs stretched at a great height from the ground between bowls ten feet apart or one may find such a snare spread across a stream at a spot where the trees on either side do not intermingle their boughs how in such cases does the spider accomplish its purpose there is little doubt that whenever practicable the spider walks round sometimes crawling quite an astounding distance but that it can at need resort to another method is easily proved by a very simple experiment in the house fill any vessel a basin or a bath with water and arrange an upright post in the middle placing a spider upon it if the air in the room is absolutely still the captive is powerless to escape but if draughts are present it will sooner or later disappear and it accomplishes this feat by emitting a thread which caught by the air current is drawn out from its spinnerets till it by and by becomes entangled in the surrounding furniture this power of emitting silk to some little distance and allowing the wind to draw it out is as we shall see frequently exercised in the early life of many spiders the foundation lines which may thus have given the spider great trouble to secure are of extreme importance to it and may serve for several snares in succession there is little hesitation or delay about the subsequent operations the spokes of the wheel are readily formed by carrying lines across to opposite points of the framework and uniting them where they intersect they are laid down in no special order but more or less alternation is generally noticeable apparently for the purpose of keeping the tension equally balanced and the spider will occasionally desist in order to go and brace up the framework with additional stays which generally have the effect of converting it to a polygon before long the requisite number of fairly equidistant spokes or radii are visible and then the spider starting from the center rapidly spins a spiral thread consisting of a few coils only to the circumference stepping from spoke to spoke this is only a temporary scaffolding and will not be suffered to remain in the completed snare if the structure is touched at this stage of the operations it does not adhere to the finger the viscid spiral remains to be laid down though it does not hesitate for a moment the spider now works with a peculiar deliberation but the operation will be much better understood by actual observation than by any amount of description and we shall only recommend the reader to note that the new spiral is exceedingly elastic and that at the moment of its attachment to a spoke it is stretched and let go like the string of a bow 
the spider seems carefully to avoid treading on it as it proceeds utilizing the non-viscid spiral scaffolding already described a little attention to the center of the wheel and the snare is complete some species of apura entirely remove the center leaving a circular empty space while others fill it in with an irregular network of threads how does the garden spider avoid getting caught in its own web we have shown that there are many lines which are not viscid and no doubt these are utilized as far as possible but it can hardly happen that the spider never touches adhesive portions of the web with legs or body possibly some explanation is furnished by an ingenious experiment which fabre performed he found that a glass rod lightly smeared with oil did not adhere to the viscid spiral neither did a leg freshly taken from a garden spider unless allowed to remain in contact for a considerable time when however this leg had been washed with bisulfide of carbon which dissolves any kind of oily substance it adhered at once it would seem likely therefore that the legs and body of the spider itself are protected by some oily exudation from any danger of adherence to its own lines end of the circular snare from spiders by cecil warburton a cambridge manual of science and literature 1912 read for librivox by sue anderson the community mask as a substitute for war by robert benchley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt Berard. the community mask as a substitute for war by robert benchley with war and liquor removed from the list of what's going on this week how will mankind spend the long summer evenings some advocate another war others recommend a piece of yeast in a glass of grape juice the effect is said to be equally devastating but there is a new school led by percy mackay which brings forward a scheme for occupying the spare time of the world which has at least the savour of novelty it presents the community mask as a substitute for war whenever a neighbourhood or county feels the old craving for bloodletting and gas bombing coming on a town meeting is to be called and plans drawn up for the presentation of a mask entitled democracy or from chrysalis to butterfly in this simple way one and all will be kept out in the open air and will get to know each other better thus relieving their bellicose cravings right there on the village green among themselves without dragging a foreign nation into the mess at all the slogan is fight your neighbors first why go abroad for war the community mask idea is all right in itself there certainly can be no harm in dressing up to represent the three platoon system or the spirit of machinery and reciting free verse to the effect that i am the three platoon system firemen i represent and the clash and clang of the hook and ladder company no one could find fault with that provided that those taking part in the thing do so of their own free will and understand what they are doing the trouble with the community mask is not so much with the mask as with the community for while the mask may be a five-star sporting extra hot from the presses of percy mckay the community is the same old community that has been getting together for inter sunday school track meets and wig and footlight club amateur theatricals for years and years and the result has always been the same let us say for instance that the community of wimblehurst begins to feel the lack of a good rousing war to keep the ladies guild and the men over thirty-five busy what could be more natural than to call in mr mckay and say what have you got in the way of a nice mask for a suburban district containing many socially possible people 
and others who might do very well in ensemble work something entitled the march of civilization is selected because it calls for boy scout uniforms and a goddess of liberty costume all of which are on hand together with lots of red cross regalia left over from the war drives the plot of the thing concerns the adventures of the young girl civilization who leaves her home in the neolithic period accompanied only by her faithful old nurse language and language's little children the vowels and the consonants she is followed all the way from the neolithic age to the present time by the evil spirit indigestion but thanks to the helpful offices of the spirits of capillary attraction and indestructibility of matter she overcomes all obstacles and reaches her goal the league of nations at last but during the course of her wanderings there have been all kinds of subplots which bring the element of suspense into the thing for instance it seems that this person in digestion has found out something about civilization's father which gives him the upper hand over the girl and he together with the two gunmen heat and humidity arrange all kinds of traps for the poor thing to fall into but she takes counsel with the kind old lady self-determination of peoples and is considerably helped by the low comedy character obesity who always appears at just the right moment so in the end there is a big ensemble involving boy scouts representatives of those allies who happen to be in good standing in that particular month seven boys and girls personifying the twelve months of the year red cross workers the mayor's committee of welcome a selection of major prophets children typifying the ten different ways of cooking an egg and the all-pervading spirit of the post office department seated on a dais in the rear and watching over the assemblage with kindly eyes and an armful of bricks this then is in brief outline the march of civilization selected for presentation by the community council of wimblehurst it is to be done on the edge of the woods which line the golf course and on paper the thing shapes up rather well considerable hard feeling arises however over the choice of the children to play the parts of the vowels and the consonants it is of course not possible to have all the vowels and consonants represented as they would flutter up the stage and might prove unwieldy in the allegretto passages a compromise is therefore effected by personifying only the more graceful ones like s and the lower case f and this means that a certain discrimination must be used in selecting the actors it also means that a great many little girls are going to be disappointed and their mother's feelings outraged little alice with stanley is chosen to play the part of the craft guild movement in industry showing the rise of cooperation and unity among the working classes she is chosen because she has blonde hair which can be arranged in braids down her back obviously essential to a proper representation of industrial teamwork as a moving force in the world's progress it so happens however that the daughter of the man who is cast for humidity has had her eyes on this ingenue part ever since the printed text was circulated and had virtually been promised it by the head of house committee of the country club through whose kindness the grounds were to be used for the performance there is a heated discussion over the merits of the two contestants between mrs withstanley and the mother of the betrayed girl which results in the withdrawal of the latter's offer to furnish turkish rugs for the oriental decadence scene following this the rougher element of the community enlisted to take part in the scenes showing the building of the pyramids and the first battle of bull run appear at one of the early rehearsals in a state of bolshevik upheaval protesting against the unjust ruling which makes them attend all rehearsals and wait around on the side hill until their scenes are on keeping them inactive sometimes from two to three hours according to the finish with which the principals get through the prologue and opening scenes showing the creation 
the proletariat present an ultimatum saying that the committee in charge can either shorten their waiting hours or remove the restrictions on crap shooting on the side hill during the periods of inaction there is a meeting of the director and his assistants who elect a delegation to confer with the striking legionnaires with the result that no compromise is reached the soviet withdraws from the mask in a body threatening to set fire to the grass on the first night of the performance during the rehearsals the husband of the woman who is portraying winter wheat is found wandering along the brookside with her sister cereal spring wheat which of course makes further polite cooperation between these two staples impossible and the dance of the foodstuffs has to be abandoned at the last moment this adds to the general tension three nights before the first performance the director calls everyone to a meeting in the trophy room of the clubhouse and says that so far as he is concerned the show is off he has given up his time to come out here night after night in an attempt to put on a mask that will be a credit to the community and a significant event in the world of art and what has he found indifference irresponsibility lack of cooperation non-attendance at rehearsals and a spirit of laissez-faire in the face of which it is impossible to produce a successful mask consideration for his own reputation as well as that of the township makes it necessary for him to throw the whole thing over here and now the chairman of the committee then gets up and cries a little and says that he is sure that if everyone agrees to pull together during these last three days and to attend rehearsals faithfully and to try to get plenty of sleep mr parsley the coach will consent to help them through with the performance and he asks everyone who is willing to cooperate to say i everyone says i and mr parsley is won over as for the mask itself it is given of course and as most of the able-bodied people of the community are taking part the audience is composed chiefly of the agent and the infirm who catch muscular rheumatism from sitting out of doors and are greatly bored except during those scenes when their relatives are taking part the mask is hailed as a great success however in spite of the fact that the community has been disrupted and social life made impossible until the next generation grows up and agrees to let bygones be bygones but as a substitute for war it has no equal end of the community mask is a substitute for war by robert benchley the cylindrical silo excerpts from modern silage methods by the silver manufacturing company salem ohio nineteen eleven this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. While the silo, in one form or another, dates back to antiquity, it was not until the latter part of the 1870s that the building of silos intended for manufacture of silage began in this country in eighteen eighty two the united states department of agriculture could find only ninety one farmers in this country who used silos during the last twenty five years however silos have gradually become general in all sections of the country where dairying and stock raising are important industries it is likely if a census were taken on the number of silos in this country today that we would find between a half and three-fourths of a million of them the silo is today considered a necessity on thousands of dairy farms and we find most of them in the states that rank first as dairy states that is new york iowa illinois wisconsin pennsylvania etc the farmers that have had most experience with silage are the most enthusiastic advocates of the siloing system and the testimony of intelligent dairymen all over the country is strongly in favor of the silo 
said a new york farmer recently in one of our main agricultural papers i would as soon try to farm without a barn as without a silo the first kind of silos built in this country or abroad were simply holes or pits in the ground into which the fodder was dumped and the pit was then covered with a layer of dirt and sometimes at least weighted with planks and stones then when it was found that a large proportion of the feed would spoil by this crude method separate silo structures were built first of stone and later on of wood brick or cement as previously stated the first separate silos built were rectangular shallow structures with a door opening at one end the silos of the french pioneer siloist auguste gofar were about sixteen feet high and forty by sixteen feet at the bottom another french silo built about fifty years ago was two hundred and six times twenty one and one half feet and fifteen feet deep holding nearly fifteen hundred tons of silage silos of a similar type but of smaller dimensions were built in this country in the early stages of silo building experience has taught siloists that it was necessary to weight the fodder heavily in these silos in order to avoid the spoiling of large quantities of silage in gofar's silos boards were thus placed on top of the siloed fodder and the mass was weighted at the rate of one hundred pounds per square foot it was found however after some time that this heavy weighing could be dispensed with by making the silos deep and gradually the deep silos came more and more into use these silos were first built in this country in the latter part of the eighteen eighties at the present time none but silos at least twenty to twenty four feet deep are built no matter of what form or material they are made and most silos built are at least twenty four to thirty feet deep or more since eighteen ninety two the cylindrical form of silos has become more and more general these silos have the advantage over all other kinds in point of cost and convenience as well as quality of the silage obtained we shall later on have an occasion to refer to the relative cost of the various forms of silos and shall here only mention a few points in favor of the round silos one round silos can be built cheaper than square ones because it takes less lumber per cubic foot capacity and because lighter material may be used in their construction the sills and studdings here do no work except to support the roof since the lining acts as a hoop to prevent spreading of the walls two one of the essentials in silo building is that there shall be a minimum of surface and wall exposure of the silage as both the cost and the danger from losses through spoiling are thereby reduced the round silos are superior to all other forms in regard to this point three silage of all kinds will usually begin to spoil after a few days if left exposed to the air hence the necessity of considering the extent of surface exposure of silage in the silo while it is being fed out in a deep silo there is less silage exposed to the surface layer in proportion to the contents than in a shallow one experience has taught us that if silage is fed down at a rate slower than one point two inches daily molding is liable to set in about two inches of the top layer of the silage should be fed out daily during cold weather in order to prevent the silage from spoiling in warm weather about three inches must be taken off daily if a deeper layer of silage can be fed off daily there will be less waste of food materials some farmers thus plan to feed off five or six inches of silage daily the form of the silo must therefore be planned according to the size of the herd with special reference to this point 
Professor King estimates that there should be a feeding surface in the silo of about five square feet per cow in the herd. A herd of 30 cows will then require 150 square feet of feeding surface, or the inside diameter of the silo should be 14 feet. For a herd of 40 cows, a silo with a diameter of 16 feet will be required. For 50 cows, a diameter of 18 feet. For 100 cows, a diameter of 25 and one fourth feet, etc. End of the Cylindrical Silo Excerpts from Modern Silage Methods by the Silver Manufacturing Company, Salem, Ohio, 1911 Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson Did We Eat One Another? by Ambrose Beers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is no doubt of it. The unwelcome truth has been long suppressed by interested parties who find their account in playing sycophant to that self-satisfied tyrant modern man, but to the impartial philosopher it is as plain as the nose upon the elephant's face that our ancestors ate one another. The custom of the Fiji Islanders, which is their only stock in trade, their only claim to notoriety, is a relic of barbarism, but it is a relic of our barbarism. Man is naturally a carnivorous animal. That none but green grocers will dispute. That he was formerly less vegetarian in his diet than at present is clear from the fact that market gardening increases in the ratio of civilization. So we may safely assume that at some remote period man subsisted on an exclusively flesh diet. Our uniform vanity has given us the human mind as the acme of intelligence, the human face and figure as the standard of beauty. Of course, we cannot deny to human fat and lean an equal superiority over beef, mutton, and pork. It is plain that our meat-eating ancestors would think in this way, and being unrestrained by the mawkish sentiment attendant on high civilization, would act habitually on the obvious suggestion. A priori, therefore, it is clear that we ate ourselves. Philology is about the only thread that connects us with the prehistoric past. By picking up and piecing together the scattered remnants of language, we form a patchwork of wondrous design and significance. Consider the derivation of the word sarcophagus, and see if it be not suggestive of potted meats. Observe the significance of the phrase, Sweet Sixteen. What a world of meaning lurks in the expression, She is as sweet as a peach. And how suggestive of luncheon are the words, Tender youth. A kiss is but a modified bite. And a fond mother, when she says her babe is almost good enough to eat, merely shows that she is herself only a trifle too good to eat it. These evidences might be multiplied ad infinitum, but if enough has been said to induce one human being to revert to the diet of his forefathers, the object of this essay is accomplished. 1868 End of Did We Eat One Another? by Ambrose Beers Read by John N. Daly Theodicy by Freiherr von Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Excerpt from Preliminary Dissertation on the Conformity of Faith with Reason Published in 1710 Section 6 through 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org six the question of the conformity of faith with reason has always been a great problem in the primitive church the ablest christian authors adapted themselves to the idea of the platonists which were the most acceptable to them and were at the time most generally in favour 
little by little aristotle took the place of plato when the taste for systems began to prevail and when theology itself became more systematic owing to the decisions of the general councils which provided precise and formative formularies st augustine boethius and cassiodorus in the west and st john of damascus in the east contributed most towards reducing theology to scientific form not to mention bede alcuin st anselm and other theologians versed in philosophy finally came the schoolmen the leisure of the cloisters giving full scope for speculation which was assisted by aristotle's philosophy translated from the arabic there was formed at last a compound of theology and philosophy wherein most of the questions arose from the trouble that was taken to reconcile faith with reason but this had not met with the full success hoped for because theology had been much corrupted by the unhappiness of the times by ignorance and obstinacy moreover philosophy in addition to its own faults which were very great found itself burdened with those of theology which in its turn was suffering from association with a philosophy that was very obscure and very imperfect one must confess notwithstanding with the incomparable grotius that there is sometimes gold hidden under the rubbish of the monk's barbarous latin i have therefore oft-times wished that a man of talent whose office had necessitated his learning of language of the schoolmen had chosen to extract thence whatever is of worth in that another Pateau or thomasius had done in respect of the schoolmen what these two learned men have done in respect of the fathers it would be a very curious work and very important for ecclesiastical history it would continue the history of dogmas up to the time of the revival of letters owing to which the aspects of things have changed and even beyond that point for sundry dogmas such as those of physical determination of mediate knowledge philosophical sin objective precisions and many other dogmas in speculative theology and even in the practical theology of cases of conscience came into currency even after the council of trent seven a little before these changes and before the great schism in the west that still endures there was in italy a sect of philosophers which disputed this conformity of faith with reason which i maintain they were dubbed avorius because they were adherents of a famous arab author who was called the commentator by preeminence and who appeared to be the one of all his race that penetrated furthest into aristotle's meaning this commentator extending what greek expositors had already taught maintain that according to aristotle and even according to reason and at that time the two were considered almost identical there was no case for the immortality of the soul here is his reasoning the human kind is eternal according to aristotle therefore if individual souls die not one must resort to the metempsychosis rejected by the philosopher or if there were always new souls one must admit the infinity of the souls existing from all eternity but actual infinity is impossible according to the doctrine of the same aristotle therefore it is a necessary conclusion that the souls that is the forms of organic bodies must perish with the bodies or at least this must happen to the passive understanding that belongs to each one individually thus there will only remain the active understanding common to all men which according to aristotle comes from outside and which must work wheresoever the organs are suitably disposed even as the wind produces a kind of music when it is blown into properly adjusted organ pipes eight nothing could have been weaker than this would be proof it is not true that aristotle refuted metempsychosis or that he proved the eternity of the human kind and after all it is quite untrue that an actual infinity is impossible 
yet this proof passed as irresistible among aristotelians and induced in them the belief that there was a certain sublunary intelligence and that our active intelligence was produced by participation in it but others who adhered less to aristotle went so far as to advocate a universal soul forming the ocean of all individual souls and believed this universal soul alone capable of subsisting whilst individual souls are born and die according to this opinion the souls of animals are born by being separated like drops from their oceans when they find a body which they can animate and they die by being reunited to the ocean of souls when the body is destroyed as streams are lost in the sea many even went so far as to believe that god is that universal soul although others thought that this soul was subordinate and created this bad doctrine is very ancient and apt to dazzle the common herd it is expressed in these beautiful lines of virgil aeneid book six verse seven twenty four written in latin and again elsewhere virgil gorgics book four verse two twenty one again written in latin nine plato's soul of the world has been taken in this sense by some but there is more indication that the stoics succumb to that universal soul which swallows all the rest those of this opinion might be called monophysites since according to them there is in reality only one soul that subsists m bernier observes that this is an opinion almost universally accepted amongst scholars in persia and in the states of the grand mogul it appears even that it has gained a footing with the cabalists and with the mystics a certain german of swabian birth converted to judaism some years ago who taught under the name of moses germanus having adopted the dogmas of spinoza believed that spinoza revived the ancient kabbalah of the hebrews and a learned man who confuted this proselyte jew appears to be of the same opinion it is known that spinoza recognizes only substance in the world whereof individual souls are but transient modifications valentin Vigel, pastor at Suppau in saxony a man of wit even of excessive wit although people would have it that he was a visionary was perhaps to some extent of that opinion as was also a man known as johann angelus Silesius, author of certain quite pleasing little devotional verses in german in the form of epigrams which have just been reprinted in general the mystic's doctrine of deification was liable to such a sinister interpretation gerson has already written opposing roycebrook a mystical writer whose intention was evidently good and whose expressions were excusable but it would be better to write in a manner which has no need of excuses although i confess that oft-times expressions which are extravagant and as it were poetical have greater force to move and to persuade than correct forms of statement ten the annihilation of all that belongs to us in our own right carried to great lengths by the quietists might equally well be veiled irreligion in certain minds as is related for example concerning the quietism of fo originator of a great chinese sect after having preached his religion for forty years when he felt death was approaching he declared to his disciples that he had hidden the truth from them under the veil of metaphors and that all reduced itself to nothingness which he said was the first source of all things that was still worse so it would seem than the opinion of the avorios both of these doctrines are indefensible and even extravagant nevertheless some moderns have made no difficulty about adopting this one and universal soul that engulfs the rest it has met with only too much applause amongst the so-called free thinkers and m de presiac a soldier and man of wit who dabbled in philosophy at one time aired it publicly in his discourses 
the system of pre-established harmony is the one best qualified to cure this evil for it shows that there are of necessity substances which are simple and without extension scattered throughout all nature that these substances must subsist independently of every other except god and that they are never wholly separated from organic body those who believe that souls capable of feeling but incapable of reason are mortal or who maintain that none but reasoning souls can have feeling offer a handle to the monocytites for it will ever be difficult to persuade men that beasts feel nothing and once the admission has been made that that which is capable of feeling can die it is difficult to found upon reason a proof of the immortality of our own souls end of theodicy published in seventeen ten by ferrer von gottfried wilhelm leibniz excerpt from preliminary dissertation on the conformity of faith with reason section six through ten the fate of sir john franklin by john ray this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the veil that so long concealed from our view the fate of sir john franklin and others of our gallant countrymen engaged in the arduous and hazardous task of exploring the polar seas has suddenly and unexpectedly lifted presenting a spectacle painfully distressing on sunday last october twenty second dr ray of the hudson's bay company arrived in england from the arctic regions where he had been deputed to the survey of the western coast of boothia and in the prosecution of this engagement became possessed of the melancholy facts recorded below the following is dr ray's report to the secretary of the admiralty repulse bay july twenty nine sir i have the honour to mention for the information of my lords commissioners of the admiralty that during my journey over the ice and snow this spring with the view of completing the survey of the west shore of boothia i met with eskimo in pelly bay from one of whom i learned that a party of white men kabloonans had perished from want of food some distance to the westward and not far beyond a large river containing many falls and rapids subsequently further particulars were received and a number of articles purchased which places the fate of a portion if not all of the then survivors of sir john franklin's long-lost party beyond a doubt a fate as terrible as the imagination can conceive the substance of the information obtained at various times and from various sources was as follows in the spring four winters past spring eighteen fifty a party of white men amounting to about forty were seen travelling southward over the ice and dragging a boat with them by some eskimo who were killing seals near the north shore of king william's land which is a large island none of the party could speak the eskimo language intelligibly but by signs the party were made to understand that their ship or ships had been crushed by ice and that they were now going to where they expected to find deer to shoot from the appearance of the men all of whom except one officer looked thin they were then supposed to be getting short of provisions and purchased a small seal from the natives at a later date the same season but previous to the breaking up of the ice the bodies of some thirty persons were discovered on the continent and five on an island near it about a day's long journey to the northwest of a large stream which can be no other than back's great fish river named by the eskimo dutkohikalik as its description and that of the low shore in the neighbourhood of point ogle and montreal island agree exactly with that of sir george back some of the bodies had been buried probably those of the first victims of famine some were in a tent or tents others under the boat which had been turned over to form a shelter and several lay scattered about in different directions of those found on the island one was supposed to have been an officer as he had a telescope strapped over his shoulders and his double-barreled gun lay underneath him from the mutilated state of many of the corpses and the contents of the kettles it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last resource cannibalism 
as a means of prolonging existence there appeared to have been an abundant stock of ammunition as the powder was emptied in a heap on the ground by the natives out of the kegs or cases containing it and a quantity of ball and shot was found below the high water mark having probably been left on the ice close to the beach there must have been a number of watches compasses telescopes guns several double-barreled etc all of which appeared to have been broken up as i saw pieces of those different articles with the eskimo together with some silver spoons and forks i purchased as many as i could get a list of the most important of these i enclose with a rough sketch of the crests and initials of the forks and spoons the articles themselves shall be handed over to the secretary of the hudson's bay company on my arrival in london none of the eskimo with whom i conversed had seen the whites nor had they ever been at the place where the bodies were found but they had their information from those who had been there and who had seen the party when travelling i offer no apology for taking the liberty of addressing you as i do so from a belief that their lordships would be desirous of being put in possession at as early date as possible of any tidings however meagre and unexpectedly obtained regarding this painfully interesting subject i may add that by means of our guns and nets we obtained an ample supply of provisions last autumn and my small party passed the winter in snow houses in comparative comfort the skins of the deer shot affording abundant warm clothing and bedding my spring journey was a failure in consequence of an accumulation of obstacles several of which my former experience in arctic travelling had not taught me to expect i have etc john ray m d commanding hudson bay company arctic expedition end of the fate of sir john franklin by john ray read by phil schempf the nature of the human mind benedict spinoza a chapter from the philosophy of spinoza edited by joseph rotner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the essence of man is formed by certain modes of attributes of god that is to say modes of thought the idea of all of them being prior by nature to the modes of thought themselves and if this idea exists other modes which also have an idea in nature prior to them must exist in the same individual likewise therefore an idea is the first thing which forms the being of the human mind but it is not the idea of a non-existent thing for then the idea itself could not be said to exist it will therefore be the idea of something actually existing neither will it be the idea of an infinite thing for an infinite thing must always necessarily exist and this is absurd therefore the first thing which forms the actual being of the human mind is the idea of an individual thing actually existing the knowledge of everything which happens in the object of any idea necessarily exists in god in so far as he is considered as modified by the idea of that object that is to say in so far as he forms the mind of any being the knowledge therefore necessarily exists in god of everything which happens in the object of the idea constituting the human mind that is to say it exists in him in so far as he forms the nature of the human mind or whatever happens in the object of the idea constituting the human mind must be perceived by the human mind in other words an idea of that thing will necessarily exist in the human mind that is to say if the object of the idea constituting the human mind be a body nothing can happen in that body which is not perceived by the mind if the body were not the object of the human mind the ideas of the modifications of the body would not be in god in so far as he has formed our mind but would be in him in so far as he has formed the mind of another thing that is to say the ideas of the modification the ideas of the modifications of the body would not be in our mind but we have ideas of the modification of a body therefore the object of the idea constituting a human mind is a body 
and that too actually existing again if there were also any other object of the mind besides a body since nothing exists from which some effect does not follow the idea of some effort produced by this object would necessarily exist in our mind but there is no such idea therefore the object of the idea constituting the human mind is a body or a certain mode of extension actually existing and nothing else hence it follows that man is composed of mind and body and that the human body exists as we perceive it hence we see not only that the human mind is united to the body but also what is to be understood by the union of the mind and body but no one can understand it adequately or distinctly without knowing adequately beforehand the nature of our body for those things which we have proved hitherto are altogether general nor do they refer more to man than to other individuals all of which are animate although in different degrees for of everything there necessarily exists in god an idea of which he is the cause in the same way as the idea of the human body exists in him and therefore everything that we have said of the idea of the human body is necessarily true of the idea of any other thing we cannot however deny that ideas like objects themselves differ from one another and that one is more excellent or contains more reality than another just as the object of one idea is more excellent and contains more reality than another therefore in order to determine the differences between the human mind and other things in its superiority over them we must first know as we have said the nature of its object that is to say the nature of the human body i am not able to explain it here nor is such an explanation necessary for what i wish to demonstrate this much nevertheless i will say generally that in proportion as one body is better adapted than another to do or suffer many things in the same proportion will the mind at the same time be better adapted to perceive many things and the more the actions of a body depend upon itself alone and the less other bodies cooperate with it in action the better adapted will the mind for distinctly understanding we can thus determine the superiority of one mind to another we can also see the reason why we have only a very confused knowledge of our body together with many other things which i shall deduce in what follows End of the nature of the human mind benedict spinoza a noble life work after fifty seven by isabella webb parks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org in eighteen eighty miss sophia b packard then corresponding secretary of the women's american baptist home missionary society with her old-time friend and efficient helper miss harriet e giles made a trip through the south in order to become better acquainted with the needs of the missionary work among the negroes the poverty ignorance and degradation of the colored women pierced the hearts of these christian women miss packard had already accomplished a noble life work a preeminently successful teacher she had held successively the positions of preceptress in new salem academy in a private school in connecticut literary society at suffield and principal of oriel institute in worcester afterwards she was for many years pastor's assistant to dr morimer both at shawmut avenue boston and at tremont temple in this position her work among the poor called her attention to the need of home missionary work and in eighteen seventy eight she resigned her position with dr lorimer and started the movement which resulted in the organization of the home missionary society of this she was elected corresponding secretary she was now fifty-seven years of age almost anyone else would have gone home from the south and urged younger women to go to the rescue of their sisters in black not so miss packard she resigned the secretaryship of the missionary society and asked to be sent south to teach the colored women a storm of opposition and remonstrance greeted her proposal she was too old to undertake a new work of such magnitude 
with the prevalent view of missionary work both at home and foreign the good sisters thought that many not to say any others could do the work in the south while she could not be spared from her present position finally and conclusively the society had no money for so great an undertaking more than once the two heroic women in face of seemingly insuperable difficulties gave up their purpose but each time the conviction of duty returned with increased power and they arose from a sleepless night saying we must go south one by one the difficulties were overcome by private solicitation miss packard raised enough money to sustain them a few months feeling it most desirable that they go as the approved servants of a responsible society she paid this money into the treasury of the missionary society and again asked to be sent south in april eighteen eighty one miss packard and miss giles reached atlanta their chosen field of labor when they called upon the pastor of friendship baptist church colored they found him on his knees praying that god would send christian women to teach the women of his race their school opened april eleventh in the damp dark basement of friendship church with eleven pupils within three months more than eighty scholars were enrolled during the first summer mrs packard and giles remained in atlanta visiting the homes of the colored people in the fall they opened their school with one hundred and seventy-three pupils from that time miss packard's life was one of ceaseless toil eight months of the year in her school in the south the other four in the north raising the necessary funds the history of her work in both lines is full of the miracle of faith but the limits of this article allow little more than a summary of results by a remarkable chain of circumstances which miss packard and miss giles believed to be clearly providential the hon j d rockefeller became interested in the school and has since been its most munificent benefactor in honor of his wife the institution was given her maiden name spellman april eleventh eighteen ninety one spellman seminary celebrated its tenth birthday but not in the basement of friendship church a most beautiful chapel was crowded to its utmost capacity with the students teachers and friends of the seminary this chapel is situated in a fine large brick building called rockefeller hall near it are three other large brick buildings packard hall the industrial building and a laundry another thirty five thousand dollar brick building the gift of mr rockefeller is about to be erected four large frame buildings some of the old u s barracks are occupied as dormitories these buildings are located upon a valuable fourteen acre lot on the outskirts of the city the number of students gathered on that memorable occasion was eight hundred and sixty of teachers thirty three the seminary has excellent normal preparatory scientific and industrial departments and is well supplied with necessary apparatus library etc it is unique in the exceptional advantages it offers in the following departments as might be expected from the character of the two women who founded the school it gives the most prominence to its biblical and religious department the bible is used as a textbook and companion studies as christian evidences ethics etc are thoroughly taught the familiarity of the students with the english bible is a gratifying surprise to a visitor in their bible classes but they do not stop with a mere intellectual knowledge of the scriptures the motto on the wall of the chapel our whole school for christ expresses the spirit of the work hundreds of girls have found christ at spellman miss packard counted a week without conversions a week of saddest failure a legitimate outcome of the work just mentioned is the missionary training department two of spellman's daughters have already gone as missionaries to africa the nurse training department is another valuable feature in this department a thorough course of study in physiology and hygiene is provided and the leading physicians of atlanta give free lectures but more than the theory is taught 
in a school of more than four hundred boarding pupils even in the exceptionally healthy city of atlanta there are always some sick a small frame building is fitted up for a sick ward and there the sick are cared for by members of the nurse training department on january third eighteen ninety two the beautiful chapel of spelman seminary was again crowded to overflowing by the students teachers and friends of the institution but the hush of sadness pervaded the room and low voices and tearful eyes told of the shadow of a great sorrow on an easel on the platform stood a fine crayon portrait of miss packard but the grand woman through whom god had wrought the miracle that we saw around us was gone forever it was meet that with bowed heads and stricken hearts the friends of the colored race nay of humanity gathered to do honor to her memory on the seventeenth of the preceding june miss packard had entered upon her reward it is impossible says jacoby to be a hero in anything unless one is first a hero in faith the briefest sketch of miss packard's life must be poorly drawn indeed if it fail to allow that she deserves a place among the heroes of faith of whom the world was not worthy nor was miss packard one of those who have the faith that removes mountains yet have not love the teachers associated with her tell how in the midst of perplexing cares and crushing burdens often in great bodily weakness she constantly planned for every one's comfort but her own her pupils bear testimony to the tender solicitude for their welfare and the warm sympathy which bound them to her by ties of strongest affection self was lost in her work she never uttered a word of boasting for what she had done nor of complaint for what she suffered the greatest thing that can be said of any human being is to be truthfully said of miss packard in her life her work her character she was christ-like end of a noble life work after fifty seven by isabella webb parks